Good morning. Welcome to the December 5th worship service. My name is Terry Lou Birch, and I'll be your worship leader this morning. For those at home and those in the parking lot, thank you for tuning in to Asbury South 91.1 FM. And if you're in the parking lot, you want to honk so we know you can hear us? I'm assuming that was a yes. <laughs> we will be decorating the church's Christmas tree today immediately after the service. Your help is very much appreciated and very much needed. For the next two weeks, December 6th and 13th, the community store will be restocking on Monday evening at 7 p.m. instead of the usual Monday mornings at 9.30. This gives others a chance to help that may not be available during the day. On Sunday, December 12th, bring your wallets. The congregation will have a chance to shop at the store after the service. They have a great selection of items since there has been several new donations. If you have any questions or if you want to volunteer, contact Diana Sexton back here. <clears throat> I want you to check out the lights in the fellowship hall at some point. Thanks to Tim Bumgardner, Lou Casperson, and the Friday Morning Cafe, we were able to replace the old lights with new energy efficient ones. That's very good for the planet Earth. It makes the area very much brighter as well. If you, yeah, yay. <laughs> if you bring any items for the community store, please put them in the donation room, which is room three, in the education wing. There is an education meeting tomorrow evening um, at 6 p.m. All are invited to come and share their ideas. A Christmas sing-along will be held on Saturday, December 18th, beginning at 5 p.m. Come and sing your favorite Christmas hymns and holiday favorites. So our current office computer has reached the point of no upgrading, and it's slower than molasses in January. We are taking advantage of the Black Friday deals to purchase a new one, which is compatible with the upcoming Windows 11, and it will move us forward with today's technology needs. A sizable pledge toward it has already been made, but if you would like to help with this item, please mark your donation for computer. If donations exceed the amount needed for this project, the extra will go to the general fund. Thank you for that very much from Carol Lindsay, our interim finance chair. The Friday Morning Cafe completed a successful 2021 season on December 3rd. They hope to be returning the last Friday in March in 2022. Thank you to all the volunteers whose efforts made the cafes possible. Yay. Make sure you check the insert in your bulletin for any other announcements, but now Pastor Sherry has a few. Thank you. It was supposed to be one. I do actually have a few announcements. Uh, first, I would want to, I'd like to say thank you to the Asbury South Women's Circle. If any of you stopped by the church yesterday, it was full of people and the sights and sounds of the season as they had a successful bazaar. So I just want to say thank you to everyone, um, including the scouts who worked hard to help make that happen. So thanks be to God. It is always good to fill the church with godly activity. Also, a related announcement, and that is the Asbury South Women's Circle meeting, which is Saturday, December 11th, that's Saturday coming up at 10 a.m. There's going to be a cookie exchange, and donations for helpful hearts, which is baby stuff, will be collected. So that is Saturday the 11th at 10 a.m. here in the church. And then the last announcement, this is the real one that I was getting, this is the one I planned to get up for, let's put it that way. If you are a member of the church council and you have not already heard, there is a special charge conference scheduled for Thursday, December 9th at 6 o'clock, specifically to address the casting of our church ballot regarding the Boy Scouts, plan of America, Boy Scouts of America reorganization plan in response to what's going on with the National Boy Scouts and their litigation and the associated bankruptcy. As a church that is a sponsor, sponsoring organization, we have a ballot to cast, and so we have to have a special charge conference. Um, also, please know that um, it has come to my attention that a lot of people no longer know what a charge conference is. The charge conference, this is the uh, uh, nutshell version, so you know, it is part of the United Methodist structure. 
um, and we'll have more information. But in a nutshell, keep it in mind that think of it as something similar to the annual conference, but it deals with things that happen at the local church level. The local church is the charge. In our case, our charge is Asbury. A charge can be more than one church. Our church is Asbury South in the Capital South area. Um, so when there are specifically things that relate to our church but connect to the larger church, then it's more than just a church council meeting. It becomes a charge conference. And as a perfect example, the litigation and the plan for reorganization with the Boy Scouts our church is involved, so it's a chart, a church, a, oh gosh, a charge conference in this case, which means the church council members vote as the charge conference, but it's a special meeting. The only thing we can handle at that meeting is that information because it's a special meeting. The difference between a church council meeting, besides it being local church stuff that is not necessarily connected to the larger church versus something like this that is by nature connected to the larger church. We can have a church council meeting at any time we want. We can only have a charge conference with the permission, with the written permission of uh, Dr. Bias, our district superintendent, which we have. So if you are a church council member, this is important to try and be at this meeting on, at six o'clock on Thursday. It is our charge conference relating to the Boy Scouts of America. Um, I believe that is the last announcement. I have one more announcement. I'm going to sneak one in since I have a mic. That's just to be sure there's been some a confusion as to when our Christmas Eve service is going to be. So whatever you have seen or heard, it will be four o'clock on Christmas Eve. Uh, the primary reason is there's some that thought one thing and some that thought another. Our um, Outside advertisements all say 4 o'clock, so this year it will be 4 o'clock. And then when the uh, worship committee meets this week, uh, we will talk about what time it'll be next year. But for this year, 4 o'clock on Christmas Eve, because that's when everybody else is going to show up. So we need to be here. Um, thank you. For, I know it's a lot of announcements, but thank you for your attention, because it's important for you to know this. And I don't even, oh, now it's next is Terry Lee. <clears throat> Make sure you run the tape back if you forgot all that stuff. Last week, we lit the candle of hope, asking that we might see God's hope in all areas of our lives and that we might share God's hope with everyone. Today, we light the second, we are on the second Sunday of Advent and we light the candle of peace. May we find God's peace in our hearts and carry God's peace with us in the world. May God's light of peace shine upon us today to show us God's ways of peace. Blessed be the God of the world and the God of ancient Israel, who sent Christ into the world to extend God's grace to all people, to set all people free. Like the people of the scriptures, in the present age, we seem destined for struggle conflict, and disagreement. We say we want peace, but we quickly jump into argument and competition. We fear difference and fight the unknown instead of embracing different and working for peace and harmony. May Christ help us share with others the peace and the hope he brings to all who believe in him. Please now join in the Advent response, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, Verses 1 and 2.
Welcome today to this time of preparation. We want to be ready, for the coming Messiah will bear life and hope and peace. Let us open our hearts and let us open our spirits to be stilled. Let us be at peace in the world. Please remain standing if you are able to join in hymn number 203, Hail to the Lord's Anointed. Sorry, in the sound booth, I knocked my mic off. So it's back, hopefully. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Let us go to our awesome God in prayer this morning. Oh God, we admit we have begun decorating our homes, decorating our churches, buying and wrapping our gifts. But God, we need to sometimes have your help simply to prepare our hearts and our spirits to receive your message of peace, to truly get into the spirit of this season of joyous anticipation. As we gather together this morning, inside, outside, or online, please free us from the things, whatever they are, that harness us and stand between us and the hope and peace that you want so much to offer us in Jesus. Flood our lives with your love and your hope and your peace on this day 
May the light of your Holy Spirit shine within us and may your power fill us in our worship that we might be prepared and empowered for another week of living in the name of Jesus, the Christ child, whose birth we anticipate again. God, fill us with love overflowing. Fill us with hope overflowing. Fill us with peace overflowing. So it pours out onto us and all over this neighborhood as well. In Jesus' name, we pray and do all things. Amen. Terry Lee. Children of God, are we not? Yes. Good, you're getting the kids' moments. Merry Christmas, Hanukkah, Wanda. Exactly. So I'll do it one more time. Yes. Merry Christmas, Hanukkah, Wanda. Amen. Merry Christmas, Hanukkah, Wanda. Good job. I taught that to the grandkids. And then I explained why. Why, Nana? Why Christmas, Hanukkah, Wanda? At which point I told them why. Between November 1st and January 15th, there are approximately 29 holidays observed by seven of the world's major religions. Now, while I believe in the Messiah, Jesus Christ, yay Christmas, and Santa Claus, I also believe that everyone has a right to their own beliefs. So Merry Christmas, Hanukkah, Wanda. So while I was doing that, I thought, oh, let's find out. Did you know yesterday was National Cookie Day? Yes. If you're on my Facebook page, you know it, because I'm all about the cookies. Just so you know, this, this, this is 10 pages of all the holidays, national, public, religious, and weird, in the month of December. There are 261 holidays in December. I can't fit them all into Christmas, Hanukkah, Wanda. Not that I haven't tried. There is Rosa Parks Day. There is National Mutt Day. There is World Soil Day. I, I don't make this stuff up. There is National Microwave Oven Day, some of which, yes, and everybody appreciates that. Make sure you remember that. There is Constitution Day. The Feast of Ambrose Day. Immaculate Conception Day. I'll not go any further. International Mountain Day, Human Rights Day, Christmas Card Day, my personal favorite, National Dingaling Day. <laughs> By the way, are the bells playing December 12th? Because that's when it is. <laughs> then you have National Cocoa Day, one of my favorites, National Monkey Day, National Wear Your Pearls Day. I'm not making this up. National Sangria Day. <clears throat> Just saying. Uh, National Arabic Language Day. National Flashlight Day. National Flashlight. National Humbug Day. Uh-huh. Christmas Eve. Oh, there's the one we know. And then to go with Christmas Eve is National Eggnog Day. I believe in that. The National Candy Cane Day, which, if you're keeping track, is the day after Christmas. There is St. Stephen's Day, and Monday, December 27th, is National Fruitcake Day. Well, okay. It's not on here. Well, and then Wednesday, December 29th, if you're interested, is National Pepper Pot Day. And if you're really into bacon, such as some people, National Bacon Day is the 30th of December. I'll just do two more. Festival Day is December 31st. That also happens to coincide with New Year's Eve. Go figure. 
And then there's International New Year's Eve, which is also December 31st. I don't know the difference, but it's here. So 261 holidays from December 1st to December 31st. So the fact that I say Merry Christmas, Hanukkah, Wanza, or I say Happy Holidays to anybody at the Dollar Tree, at Aldi, pick a place. I do it out of respect. Not because I don't want them to believe in Jesus Christ. I do. But I also try to do respect. So that is why a lot of us say Happy Holidays. Or in my case, Merry Christmas, Hanukkah, Wanza, because it works. Let's have a repeat after me prayer. Dear God, thank you for all our blessings. And thank you for sending us the baby Jesus. Amen. See, didn't know that stuff, did you? All right, now we're going to switch gears. Our scripture lesson today is from Luke chapter 1, verses 68 through 79. This is based on the Common English Bible translation. Bless the Lord God of Israel, because he has come to help and has delivered his people. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in his servant David's house. Just as he said through the mouths of his holy prophets long ago, he has brought salvation from our enemies and from the power of all those who hate us. He has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and remembered his holy covenant, the solemn pledge he made to our ancestor Abraham. He has granted that we would be rescued from the power of our enemies so that we could serve him without fear. In holiness and righteousness, in God's eyes, for as long as we live. You, child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way. You will tell his people how to be saved through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of our God's deep compassion, the dawn from heaven will break upon us to give light to those who are sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death to give us on the path of peace. This is the word of God for the people of God.
Amen, and thanks be to God for that. Before we pray, I just have to mention a ministry that has been near and dear to my heart for many years, and it was one of the ones not on your list, and that is World AIDS Day. Um, we don't celebrate AIDS, but the focus of the, the day is to look not at the death that AIDS brings, but the people who still have life. So that's just a ministry that World AIDS Day still takes place, December 1st. Um, but I just wanted to put that plug out there because, yes, there are people who are still struggling to live lives as they have this AIDS virus in their body. So something near and dear to me um, and people near and dear to me. Let us pray. Oh, Lord God, we come before you on this day, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would instruct us now. Fill our hearts with spirit light that we may see you and hear your call to be reflections of the living Christ in our church, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods. May your word give us instruction for how to better live into our callings, and may it be your word and your word only that is proclaimed and received. May your spirit be set free among us. Amen. Amen. This morning, we have jumped into the Gospel of Luke. And for those of you who may need a refresher course, Luke is an important man because he's different. He is an educated Greek man. He's also a Gentile. He's a physician. He's a scientist. He's a friend of Paul's. And when you put all this together, he is a man who is preoccupied with facts and data and details. So his task in writing his two books, which are Luke and Acts, but his primary task was to investigate the stories, the hubbub, if you will, surrounding this person, Jesus. Luke had a patron or a benefactor who was sponsoring his work, and Luke decides that the best way to investigate who Jesus is, is all of this hullabaloo that takes place around this man. He sets out to place Jesus in human history. So that requires that he investigate the history of Israel, since Jesus was, after all, a Jewish man. And he considers all the prophecy that leads up to Jesus all the prophecy surrounding the so-called Messiah or the promised one of God. And in his diligence, Luke basically goes back to the beginning, which includes Old Testament prophecy. He refers back to that. And Luke is one who offers us the pronouncement of John, the one who would come before to prepare the world for Jesus' arrival. He talks about John's ministry and John's mission. To this end, Luke includes the stories that we go to so often during this time, which includes the accounts of the encounters between Gabriel and Zechariah, Gabriel the angel. There are uh, stories of Zechariah and Elizabeth, Elizabeth's conversations. And then Luke details the predictions about Jesus' birth, including the encounter between Gabriel and Mary, the mother. Luke also includes the story of Mary visiting Elizabeth and the amazing conversation that Mary has with God, um, in which Mary praises God after receiving and embracing the blessing that Elizabeth has pronounced, which is that Mary is blessed among women. And all of this happens earlier than the verses we heard read in chapter 1. Lots of this is there. So if you haven't caught on, Luke is steeped in details surrounding Jesus. If you have a question about Jesus, Luke might be a good place to start. Just saying. Today, specifically though in the verses that we read, we are reminded of God's promise to redeem Israel and the prophecy is included that puts Israel on notice to get ready because the promised one is actually on the way. Now we have to remember that many generations have passed since the promise was originally made. And it may have fallen off of their radars because it took so long for God to make good on his promise. But what we are seeing today is the prophecy, the promise 
the enthusiasm because they have been reminded that the promise is real and God is about to make good on that promise. Luke's account is meant to restore hopes for the Jews and the Gentiles who before weren't even included in the promise. So today's verses, these 11 verses that we had read already, in a nutshell, say that people, and that ultimately includes us, must not give up because the hope that Israel had is real and the promise of God is finally, finally, finally on the way. John the forerunner, has already been born in the text, and Zechariah, his father, is setting the stage for what John has been chosen to do, which is lead a vibrant and active ministry in which he prepares Jesus for the world, and he prepares the world for Jesus. And the prophecy today of Zechariah calls people's attention back to that promise. Hey, it's been many generations, but the promise is coming true, and we know it's about to be true because the one who is here to prepare the way is the son I just had. Now, Terry Lou read verses from the Common English Bible, but I want to read verses 68, no, 69. Oh, I don't know which verses I wrote. 68 through 70. Um, And this is from the message translation. If you want to, I would encourage you to read along what's printed versus these verses, because I like how they give you, for me at least, let me say it for me, they give me a different and clearer image of what's there. Here are just these three verses. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who came and set God's people free. God set the power of salvation in the center of our lives and in the very house of David, God's servant, just as God promised long ago through the preaching of God's holy promises. And specifically, verse 69, God set the power of salvation in the center of our lives and in the very house of David, God's servant, in the center of our lives. Now, most of us probably have a good sense of what the center is, but just so I wasn't too arrogant to assume that I presume more than I know, I actually went to the dictionary and looked up center, and it was surprisingly simple. It means the middle point or the middle part of something, or a person or thing that is causing a lot of interest, argument, etc., or the position of a person that is causing a lot of interest, argument, etc. So God placed the power of salvation in the center of people's lives. The promised deliverer was going to be central in their lives. At the center of scripture, is God. And how is God fulfilling that promise? The power of salvation in the very center of our lives. So one way to think of it is this way. Of all the ways God could have redeemed humankind, could have saved us from sin and eternal damnation, God chose, God chose to place the power of salvation in the person of Jesus Christ in the center of human life, not up on some mountain far away, hard to access, but in the center of human experience, a human being who came into the world like every other human being, specifically a human being who arrived in the form of a Jewish baby boy. Think of all the things God could have done. So for a minute, remember some of the scriptural images that you associate with God, whether it's voluntary or involuntary. To give you an example, example, one of the images that I associate with God is the power, the beauty, and the splendor of creation, of God speaking all things into existence. 
I don't know about you, but when I think of creation and God speaking things into existence, the mental image that I have is like some grand fireworks where things are just popping up everywhere simply by God speaking. That is a powerful image of God to me. And then when I think of the grandeur of God speaking everything into existence, that's when I picture creation. I picture the image of God. So I want you to pause for a second and think of what comes to your mind when you think of the power or the majesty or the grandeur of God. What comes to your mind when you think of or picture the power, the grandeur, the majesty of God? Maybe it's creation. Maybe it's the image of God parting the reed or the red sea. Maybe you picture some of the mighty battles and the victory. Maybe it's David besting the mighty and giant Goliath. Or maybe it's something New Testament, as simple as the mighty Saul, blinded and floundering as his life-transforming encounter with Jesus unfolds. Whatever your image, just hold that image of God for a moment. Powerful almighty, great creator God, however you picture God, could have chosen any vehicle, any avenue, any option as an idol to reclaim broken humankind. And God chose to use broken humankind as the vessel to restore human relationship and bring about life giving human transformation. The God who created all things, the God who parted the Red Sea, the God who did all those miracles could have chosen anything, and he chose to come as a human being. God set the power of salvation in the center of our lives and in the end, in the very house of David. Not only did God choose to come as a human, a lowly, sin-prone human, because Jesus could have sinned. But God started him as every human, as a helpless baby, and not just any baby, as the son, quote-unquote, of a working-class Jewish man, a man who, with his bride, was sent to Bethlehem without accommodations, without connections, without clout, simply because the Roman emperor wanted to be sure that everyone could be accounted for, which means essentially he wanted to make sure he was getting all the taxes he could out of all the people he could. If it was the power of salvation that God was sending into the center of human life, why not send Jesus as a powerful Roman warrior? Or better yet, what about the Roman emperor himself? Why not send Jesus as Caesar Augustus? But God didn't do that. Because to send Jesus as Caesar Augustus, the Roman emperor, would not be to set him in the very center of human life. For the Jewish people, the Israelites who were waiting for the promise, I'm pretty sure Caesar Augustus and his life would have nothing to do with the center of their lives. And then think of the promise. Not only a baby, but the very house of David, God's servant. Remember that promise? In case you forgot, at that time Israel remembered and this is the sign that God remembered, no matter how much time has passed. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is the most unlikely person to have been that vessel. He was the unlikely embodiment of the power of salvation, because even among Jews, Jesus was lacking. Mary and Joseph may have dutifully reported to Bethlehem for the census, but they ultimately called home Nazareth. And everybody knows that nothing and no one good comes out of Nazareth. 
all the promise of the universe, all the power of the universe came in a Jewish baby and not somebody who was a member of the Sanhedrin, a working class carpenter and his peasant wife. What could God have possibly been thinking? What God was thinking was to come among us, the very center of life. And because of that, this scripture is infused with hope, with promises made and fulfilled, with salvation offered and received. We have 11 verses, certainly not the entirety of the account of God or God's relationship with humankind, but it's enough because this Advent, we eagerly anticipate the re-arrival of the Christ child. And we are reminded that God made a promise to Abraham centuries before, and God made good on that promise no matter how much time had passed. Maybe not in the way Abraham envisioned. Maybe not in the time frame that Abraham's descendants had anticipated. But promises made were promises fulfilled. And we today all know that. Our faith is different than Zechariah's and Elizabeth's and John's and Mary's and even Joseph's. Because we know the end of the story and have known it must, most, if not all, of our lives. But their hope, their faith, their belief was as pure and unbridled as our own. And they had the hope. They didn't even see the reality yet. They had the hope of promises fulfilled with prophecy. And that was enough to sustain them. Like many of us today, the people of Zechariah, and Elizabeth, and Mary, and John's time, they were tired. They were beaten down by life, by promises that had been left unfulfilled, by life events that were beyond their power to control, by unanticipated things like pestilence, illness, death, war and rumors of war, defeat, discouragement, natural disasters like earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, and wildfires, people mistreating one another, lying to one another, lying about one another, using one another, oppressing one another, persecuting those who were different, wanting what was not theirs, stealing from one another. And in the midst of that life, in the center of everyday life, comes this baby who is going to grow into the man that will change every life that lets him change it. Remember that what we want to take from this passage is that it is a passage talking about God fulfilling the promise a major promise to the people Israel. And through that promise, through that baby, fulfilling a promise to the whole world that hadn't even yet been made. God, through Zechariah, is telling Israel not to lose heart. And through the same verses, God tells us the same thing today. Do not lose heart. I am the God who fulfills promises. Zechariah's words actually to his infant son spoke hope and peace and love and to all of his people. And they speak the same things to us today if we let them. This Advent, let us find peace in Zechariah's words of prophecy. Through the sun felt, I'm sorry, through the heart felt mercies of our God, God's sunrise will break in upon us, shining on those in the darkness, those sitting in the shadow of death, then showing us the way, one foot at a time, down the path of peace. Those are verses 78 and 79 from the message translation. When things get difficult, and life spirals out of control, making no sense to us, we should call, recall that ours is the same God, the God who baffles us, the God who awes us, who has dreams and high expectations for every one of us. But more than anything, ours is an awesome God who loves us, who keeps God's promises to us, no matter how long, 
no matter how much it may seem like God has forgotten, God has not because God loves us even today too much to ever break God's promises. We can when we are sick, grieving, confused, angry, hurting, lost, lonely, addicted. We can remember that God has set the power of salvation in the very center of our lives. And in the end, it was in the house of David, fulfilling that promise. Of all the things God could have done, God chose to bring God's power to the center of human life among people. Jesus lived among people, not in a sanitized way, but in the nitty gritty messiness of life. He was known to hang out with sinners, the last, the least, the lost, the broken. He was found with the mentally ill, the addicted, the nobodies of his day, which included women and children. He dared talk to those that others snubbed, like Samaritans. And he allowed himself to be touched by the untouchable, like the leper or the woman with the issue of blood. God sent, set and sent the power of salvation in the center of human life in a human being. We, like Mary, we, like Zechariah, we, like John, should be filled with hope, with peace, and with love. God loved us enough to lower himself, to lower herself, and come as a human being. Let us harness the power of salvation that was set among us. Let us be so filled with the reassurances of kingdom hope and kingdom peace that God's power spills out all over people in the 43232 zip code and beyond. May it start with us and bubble over in all facets of our lives. It was said that nothing good comes out of Nazareth. And yet, a man from Nazareth was the power of salvation set in the center of human life. There's hope in that life. There's life in that life. There's peace in that life. When you want to give in or give up, remember that Jesus was a nothing that had a lot to give to everybody. A nothing. The center of our life, a human being, the power of salvation, the power of God right among us, not just that day, not just Christmas Eve, but every day. If you keep Christ at the center, that power of salvation, if you keep the Holy Spirit at the center, if you keep God at the center, you can't go wrong. Thanks be to God for the coming Christ child, how God sets the power of salvation among us. Thanks be to Christ, ready to take up residence in the center of every one of our lives. Amen, and thanks be to God. Let us pray. This morning, God, we ask that you again pour on the love so it fills our lives and splashes over on everyone around us. And once we are splashing love everywhere, we offer these prayers. For those who feel and are alone during the holidays. For those who are fearful or anxious as the holidays come upon us because of specific things like financial crisis, emotional crisis, family relationship problems or those who are overwhelmed by things they cannot define. God, we pray for those who are bereft and bewildered because of the loss of loved ones who were alive last year at this time. God, we pray for Bob Sherman and his family as his brother has passed into life eternal. 
We pray for Clint Thompson and his family as his sister passed away a couple of weeks ago. And we pray for Clint and Jerry's daughter, Bobby Thorson, who is scheduled for surgery for a brain tumor on Wednesday. We pray for Nancy Vukovic, Billy Graham's sister, who fell and broke her shoulder in four places and is currently in rehab. We pray for Melvin Bradley, who is the brother of a friend of Margaret Johnson. Melvin is in ICU in Arizona, and doctors don't yet know what's wrong with him. We pray for Becky Bickert's friend, Christina Valdez, who has COVID pneumonia. And we pray for Christina's husband and daughter, who also have COVID. We pay, pray for Peggy Brewster, Becky Bickert's mother, who fell and re-injured her back and ribs. And we pray for Becky herself, whose physical health seems to have declined recently. We pray for Bob Souls's nephew, Rick, who has stage four cancer, and for Tanya, which is Becky's niece, who has a bleeding ulcer. We pray for Dick Sloan's sister, Diane Manley, who had a reaction to her COVID booster shot. We pray for Sue Sloan's sister, Pamela Banks, who is slowly recovering from COVID pneumonia. We pray for Sheree Briscoe, who is scheduled for surgery at Riverside Hospital on Wednesday, and for her family as they maneuver difficult times. And this is a family that says that they listen to us online. We pray for Dick and Sue Sloan's son, Mike Sloan. We pray for Nellie Jackson, who is scheduled for surgery on December 22nd. We pray for Lucy Gollowin's brother and sister-in-law, Gregory and Irene, for strength for both. We pray for the family and friends of those who died in the shooting at Oxford High School in Michigan. We pray for the shooter and his parents, and we pray for the broken, brokenness in our nation and society that leads people of all ages to think making a statement with weaponry, death, and destruction is anything other than cowardly madness. And we pray for peace in our church, in our nation, and in the world. God, hear us as we open our hearts to you. We know that you are a God who relates to us, because you put salvation in the center of our lives. These are times that bring such a mix of emotions to people. While some joyously anticipate a season of hope and peace shared with family and loved ones, others are huddled in fear, wondering how or if they will survive the season. Some have physical hurdles, some have emotional, mental, economic, or spiritual difficulties. For many, the pain is overwhelming and they will do anything to make the hurting end. May we live in such a way that we present Christ as the salve that he is and help us all find new meaning and new depth in our own faith as we anticipate and reconnect to the Christ who comes. Finally, God, thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ because without him, that bundle of love that shows up on Christmas Eve, all of us would be wasting our time, devoid of the help, the hope, the peace, the relief, and the love that we all seek, that we all need, that we all find in Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. amen. This is the season of excitement. This is the season of preparing for God's gift to us, our Messiah. With grateful hearts, let us bring forth our own offerings.
Father God, we thank you for the gift of your Son who brings with him hope and peace. We pray that these gifts bless the many in our world so that all may feel the touch of Jesus Christ. We dedicate our gifts to you, baby Jesus. Amen. Or communion, isn't it? No, they can sit. <laughs> That's okay. As a reminder, you should have received communion elements when you arrived. Um, if you didn't, there's a chance to get some. And please remember that I will specifically instruct you when to eat and when to drink so that we can eat the bread together and drink from the cup together. So now, keep this in mind. This is the time when we come to the table of blessing. This is the time when we come to God's feast of love. Come and let us celebrate the coming Messiah, who is, in fact, our host. Now to the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is, it is right. And a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, almighty God, who sent the angel Gabriel to announce the imminent Messiah, the priest Zechariah, to remind us of your promise, and John, the one who baptized, to, prepare, to proclaim that you had come among us. As Jesus the Christ, you promise to give light to all who are lost in darkness and to lead us in the way of righteousness and peace. So with your people in every land on earth and with all the company of heaven, we join in your unceasing praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and holy is your child, Jesus Christ, for whose birth in our hearts we prepare with hope and anticipation and for whose life passion, death, and resurrection, we give you thanks unending. On the night in which he gave himself up, he took bread, broke it, gave thanks to you, and said, take, eat, all of you. This is my body given for you. Whenever you eat it, do so in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for the healing of all the world. Whenever you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. And so we remember and we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be the body of Christ to a world that often sits in gloom and doom. Creator of all that is and was and ever will be, holy parent of our Lord and Savior, the coming Christ child. By him with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. In this sacred moment, in this sacred space, let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the body of Christ given for each one of you. Please now eat and be filled. This is the blood of Christ poured out for each one of you. Please drink now and have your thirst satisfied. Let us pray. Oh God, we have shared this bread and this juice as we await the arrival of the promised one. May this feast itself provide hope and peace. May it be all the hope and all the peace that each one of us needs, not merely to sustain us, but that we might thrive during this season of anticipation. May your outpouring of love provide spiritual knowledge and insight that inspires us and those around us and helps everyone, everyone live in kingdom peace, in harmony with your beautiful creation, God, forever and ever. Amen. Won't you please now stand and join in our closing hymn, Word of God Come Down on Earth, number 182. Advent prayer. I hope that you will hold on to that. It's little, 
So you can stick it in your pocket, stick it in your purse, stick it in your Bible, stick it somewhere where you can remember it and pray it every day. And if you drop it, I'm sure there's other copies out there. So I'm praying, literally, that we pray this prayer. God, we pray that you would pour on the love so it fills our lives and splashes over on everyone around us. And to each of us who prays that prayer, and even for those who don't, for all who hear, peace be with you and with all whom you love. Hope be with you and all whom you love. Now let us go out into God's world with God's peace in our spirits, God's hope on our minds, and God's love in our lives. Go in hope. Go in peace. Go with God. Go and love. Amen.